Hello everyone, welcome to the Applied Privacy Podcast, where I invite privacy pros from both industry and academia to come and share their thoughts on the privacy landscape from an engineering and research point of view. This series is called Applied Privacy because there is an imminent need for privacy products to be built to to safeguard the interest of customers, clients and businesses alike. While the government of nations have been doing their part in legislating privacy, I believe it is our job to take the baton and engineer solutions to build privacy into the products and services that we offer. While the truncheon may be used in lieu of conversation, words will always retain their power. Words are for the means to meaning and for those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. To shed some light on the truth from yet another perspective, I have with me Robin Andrews. So hey Robin, thanks for coming to the Applied Privacy Podcast. So, uh, thanks. I'm really excited to be here today with you. Yeah. So why don't you tell me more about how you got started with privacy, uh, more like what the history of Robin Andrews looks like. Sure. Um, so currently I'm the chief privacy officer of a company called Skyflow, which is a data privacy vault delivered as an API. Um, the history of Robin from a career perspective, I really actually fell into the privacy space about 15 years ago. My background and my undergraduate degree is actually accounting and finance. And I started out as a, an auditor at the big four companies, Deloitte, where I would sit down and work with clients on their financial statements and their internal controls around financial reporting. From there, I moved into the finance world and I realized that it wasn't really a job I liked doing on a day-to-day basis of just kind of number crunching like spreadsheets and forecasts and budgeting. And left that role and more or less like fell into a role in privacy at Trustark, where I was working, which was trustee at the time, where I was working with chief privacy officers in their privacy programs and helping them comply. And um, really just kind of dived into that role and learned the industry, not knowing what privacy was back in 2008. And from there went on to privacy roles in-house or within the actual departments at Google, Yahoo, Then Twilio, where I was leading a team and I was their data protection officer until joining Skyflow about six months ago. All right, great. So you've worked with internal privacy department of many different tech companies. And what have, like, my real question is like, what have you seen in your 15 year career in privacy? Like how best can the CPO and the privacy engineers work together? Yeah, those are two very different questions. You know, thinking historically, I think about some of the, the chief privacy officers I worked with as a, you know, consultant when I was at Trustark, and, and sometimes it could be someone in marketing, someone in IT. Sometimes it was a lawyer saying we need to figure out this privacy thing. Um, it really wasn't much of a, you know, unless you were in a higher regulated industry like healthcare or GLBA. Um, you know, a lot of companies were not really thinking about privacy as much until, you know, they were aware of this privacy thing, but a lot of people were thinking more security in right 2008 through more or less kind of 2018. Um, Where you were seeing the bigger privacy issues, which are still a lot of the big privacy issues we see today is in the advertising ecosystem. So, you know, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and that whole ecosystem that was built up basic three through, you know, building a profile and monetizing data about an individual through ad targeting. Um, where, so yeah, so that's what I've seen in my history of privacy is, you know, I think it was really more of an awareness issue until 2018, 2020, I would sit down with people internally and sometimes people internally wouldn't understand like how privacy was different from security or, um, like internal controls or something. Now, fast forward to 2019, 2020, more people, especially in kind of the tech space that I work in had to comply with GDPR and, you know, finding more that people in marketing and sales and product understand privacy is a, an issue that, you know, they want the company to do right. Uh, and then especially with Cambridge Analytica and some of the more and Facebook and some of the more public privacy issues. So, you know, it's been actually great for someone like me because I've been, you know, kind of evangelizing the privacy message within organizations and trying to build trust and trying to build champion champions, because now you are seeing companies, you know, hiring a lot more privacy professionals and privacy leaders and um, thinking about privacy engineering and really doing privacy right as a fundamental value for their company. Um, 
The sec quest the second question go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um how best can the CPO and the privacy engineers work together? So this is also a, an area where we've seen a lot of growth and really thinking about how these two functions can work really well together. Um, you know, the chief privacy officer or the head of a privacy function really is thinking about what's the strategy, what's the high level privacy posture of the organization, how can they obtain resources, um, how can they be compliant and, you know, everything from kind of understanding and staying up to date with the current regulations, the tools and the technologies, the coming regulations, and, um, you know, having a solid partner in the privacy engineering group that understands privacy as well, at a high level at least, and understands the data and the data flow. Um, I've felt that, you know, working together is always a, you know, it's a very collaborative, like, you know, I think that my experience working with many engineers and product managers is they want to understand the problem. They want to figure out what the problem is, understand it and help solve it. And by working collaboratively together and educating each other in your area of expertise, then um, that's been a successful way to work together. Okay. So uh, you mentioned that you work as a chief privacy officer at uh, Skyflow, I believe, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. So uh, like obviously the next natural question would be uh, what is the job like what is the day in a you know day in a, a, as a CPO at a tech company look like you know basically like what does your job entail you to do like is it more legislative focus is it more engineering focus what is exactly that you do yeah I mean it's across all functions I mean I can give you some examples I mean there's been a lot of legislation you know coming out like in the US, the FTC has come out with a rulemaking where they have a lot of questions around privacy. So, you know, my job is to kind of understand what those questions are, think about how they could apply to privacy at our organization, you know, think about if we do want to provide comments, that's part of the role. Um, part of the role is kind of a compliance aspect and, you know, making sure that the, the people internally within the company have proper training and awareness of privacy and what the issues are and want to do it right. And, you know, the compliance around actually doing it right. Um, like trust, but verify. Um, part of it is, you know, being a subject matter expert in privacy and providing guidance externally as well. Um, I, you know, the chief privacy officer, like you kind of are seeing it being more leadership or legislated oriented, but you are starting to see also this world of privacy engineering or a head of privacy engineering. And that person could be an engineer who is managing other privacy engineers to put in place the technical systems around privacy. But I, I do want to say that it's kind of, it's across the board because it's really still an emerging space um, in general. And it really depends on the organization, like how it works within your organization, where different groups fit, uh, budget, politics, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that, that I must agree, you know what, because uh, I, I'm a graduate of 2020 and uh, to me, like there was no mention in my four years of BTEC, there was no um, discussion of privacy, even though I... Uh, you know, I have taken some data science machine learning cl classes, right? So, and even now, after becoming like after becoming data science, it is just now only my organization is also uh, internal training um, everyone, regardless of your of your department, be sales, marketing, engineer, we don't really care. They are actually making us more privacy aware, so to speak. And uh, one problem that I, uh, you know, that I have uh, particularly uh, is that. The, the landscape of privacy is uh, changing very fast, right? So my question is, as a CPO, how do you stay on top of all the recent privacy changes and educate your company? Yes, the summer has been crazy. It's been just back-to-back -back kind of privacy changes. Um, I mean, there there's an industry association and a global industry association called the IAPP, the Interna International Association of Privacy Professionals, and they have a website that's free. You can go on there and get kind of current up-to-date information. They also have email subscriptions where they kind of categorize the different areas. Like if you're more interested in privacy in Asia Pacific or India or the US or Europe, you could focus on that. So part of it is really just staying up-to-date on the new rules and regulations. 
Um, I find that, you know, the sometimes there's interesting blogs or articles posted on LinkedIn or Twitter by law firms that kind of focus in the privacy area, as well as some privacy consulting companies. Um, so it's really just kind of staying on top of what's going on with the kind of the big rule makers, like the European regulators, the European uh, Court of Justice, the um, and then in the US, you know, the FTC and the CFPB and other kind of rulemaking bodies around privacy. Right. So uh, when an average person hears the word privacy, the thing that comes to their mind is usually around trust, right? So when we talk about uh, security, we, uh, for example, uh, you know, when we talk about security, we are more, uh, we are more focused on, let's say, is my data getting transferred? When my data is getting transferred, is it sniffed? Uh, and privacy would be more like, uh, what are you going to do with the data, right? So uh, my question is like, uh, for example, like it's not just about what a company can do, like what, what is right, what's worthy thing to do, right? More precisely about what you are going to do with the data when the, it, it, it is in your hands. So how do you help instill that culture within an organization? Yeah, that's kind of, this is like kind of one of my favorite things to talk about because, you know, a lot about privacy has been focused on trust. Like it's been around, you know, setting policies and efforts that may not be legally what a company has to do, but like, you know, thinking about it from a trust and um, building trust and transparency issue. Um, so, you know, instilling that culture, culture within an organization, I think, like I said before, it's been, you know, so many more people are even aware of privacy as an issue, right? Like in the last two to three years that it makes it easier as a privacy leader to instill that culture because people want to do the right thing once they're aware of it. Um, you know, I would say it comes down to the tone from the top also though, and like how, how does the company make money, right? How is, is, are they monetizing data? Because if, you know, it conflicts with how the business is actually making money, like some services that collect location data and then sell it, it's hard to instill that culture if the culture might be different. Um, but, you know, I, I think it goes back to kind of thinking about like, what are the company's values? What are the tone from the top? Um, how could you, you know, you know, think about really doing the right thing, having values, and then from there, building into your operational procedures and leadership team, those values and all your employees as well. Like, uh, so as a CPO, when you look at your company within, uh, what do you think actually motivates like uh, people, like apart from you, obviously, uh, to to learn more about like be be more privacy oriented, be more privacy educated? Is it be, is it like they don't want to commit sin of permission, or is it because they want they they don't want to co uh, commit sin of commission? Like, so are they are they are, are they morally are they ethically motivated, or are they just scared? Or like in general, the company is scared uh, to not be fined by GDPR or CCPR, let's say. So, what is the motivation? Is it scare? Is it is it is it fear, or is it like the ethics that you're talking about? I, um, I like to think that it's the ethics, but I mean, you know, in real, like in reality, it's, it's both, you know, there needs to be like GDPR didn't really have any teeth until 2018 when they, you know, said they could find 4% um, of annual global turnover. And that really made a lot of companies wake up and start realizing they had to, you know, f deal with this privacy thing. Um, you know, even with the CCPA and the upcoming CPRA in California, they've actually created kind of a body to enforce it. Um, so I'd like to say, you know, is there's more awareness around privacy, around the ethical and trust use of this data, you know, things like Roe versus Wade, um, people thinking about privacy usage, Cambridge Analytica, more awareness and people are aware of their privacy rights. I think it does become more of like a, a trust and eth ethical issue, but there is also the, um, you know, there is the, you know, you have a data breach because your data is not stored properly, or you say you're going to treat the data in one way, and then you use it another way, the FTC could say, you know, you're, you're being unfair or deceptive and how you're using this data and come after you. And that, that could result in a, you know, in an investigation, um, legal costs, litigation, potential consent decree where you have to comply and build a privacy program, which is very costly if you don't have that, um, as well as, you know, like brand and reputational risk. And so, you know, I think that, 
you know, I'd like, I'd like to believe that it's around trust and ethics and doing the right thing around collection of the data, but it, you know, there are these forcing functions that if you don't do the data, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, there are consequences. Yeah. So, so, um, so let's say that I want to get into privacy, right? So I want to get into this field. Uh, so could you provide tips to me or someone like me, perhaps from an engineering perspective, sorry, engineering background or someone who's from a, a, a low background? How can someone like me or perhaps millions like me uh, could, could uh, get into privacy? Yeah. Um, well, the nice thing is now is there are so many options to learn privacy, which is great. Um, you know, you can start by there's a professor based out of um, George Washington University in D.C., Daniel Solov, yeah. who has blogs and websites and training courses. Um, you know, I took a class recently from an organization called Data Protocol, which is a very kind of like engineering focused um data privacy, privacy engineering course. It's more focused on like the engineering application of privacy than kind of the, the fundamental re regulations and laws, but that's a very kind of engineering focus. These are the things you could do. Um, you know, you could look at, you know, like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, all have larger privacy engineering functions. You could read about those organizations on their blogs, learn more about what they do, look at job descriptions. Um, you know, and then get more involved in the community. You know, like I, I have, um, you know, like think about, there's also the IAPP. If you do join the IAPP, they have industry meetups. So they have, they're called knowledge nets in the U S and in EU. Um, I'm not sure if they do them in India, but I, I'm sure I know they do kind of an Indian group. Um, but the, so they, they bring together people, whether it's globally or like in person or virtual for events. So I would first kind of like, I'm not aware of any kind of one like university. And then, and then from the, if you want to say, go to the university, Carnegie Mellon University, and does have a privacy engineering master's and a certificate program. That's the only one I'm aware of at this point. Um, so I would say, you know, first start there, kind of delve into the, the concept and the ideas, um, even, you know, based, look at privacy policies, go to Facebook, go to Google, go to, um, you know, companies' privacy policies and look at look at them and think about what the how the controls are set and how you can, you know, change options around, let's say, like Google Maps. Like, do you want Google Maps to collect your location data? Is that of value to you? Um, and I'll use that as an example for myself, because at one point I think I turned off Google Maps because I was like, I don't want look Google collecting. On I turned off the location history collection of Google Maps. I was like, I don't want them to have my data. Um, then I kind of turn it back on because it was like easier for me to say, like if I was driving somewhere, okay, I want to go to that place I went to before and not have to search it and it'll like easier to come up. So for me, the like utility of being able, being able to do that was more of a value to me. Um, you know, now they have more controls around whether you can turn off ad tracking and everything. So there's more controls than there used to be even a couple of years ago. But um, a lot of it is, you know, just understanding kind of the fundamental value that some companies might provide um, by collecting that data, but then also understanding that you can opt out and choices around it. Mm -hmm. So that's like learning it. I want to say that actually getting into it, like saying I'm going to get a job in privacy is probably a little easier said than done. Um, you know, managing and leading a team, like it is hard for people who, you know, there's a lot in your day-to-day -day plate and it's hard to kind of teach people privacy if you don't get it. It's, it's like, right, data science or engineering. Like you would want to hire someone that has like a background in that or at least a university degree in it so you don't have to teach it to them. Um, what I've seen is, you know, some people kind of might get into like a compliance or security function within an organization and kind of raise their hand and say, I want to help out with that privacy thing and then kind of move into a privacy role that way. Um, public policy, trust, those are more kind of on the, you know, compliance or ethics side. In engineering, I mean, like what I've seen in the engineering space is somewhat similar. You know, someone that just really like it's is an engineer, knows the systems, knows the data, knows where the PII is held, um, knows things around access, data governance, internal access, deletion, um, encryption, like kind of understanding the data and how the data is held. Um, then might naturally kind of roll into like a role of a privacy engineer 
um, you know, and if, if like you need someone, cause that's really what happened during GDPR is like a lot of companies said we need to make all these technical changes and they had to, you know, we had to recruit an engineer to, to come in and help us in the privacy uh, department to make those changes. I'm sure it must be very stressful, right? Because here, like, unlike uh, your traditional roles here, I guess um, the engineering and uh, the law, the legislative or the law department of uh, any company will have to, uh, you know, work hand in hand, I believe, right? So I guess as a CPA, it must be really stressful, I believe. Um, I mean, I've been doing it for so long that I don't consider it to be stressful. I mean, I like working with, you know, I like working with engineers sitting down and saying kind of map out the data flows, explain to me um, where the data lives, you know, I've worked very closely with data scientists and internal kind of data analytics functions. And like I said before, like, yes, it is the, the thing that's most stressful is, you know, sometimes like you have to kind of beg and borrow people for their time and you might not be their top priority. Um, so that is one of the more challenging aspects is because someone might have competing priorities. Um, that's where I touched on like the tone from the top is so important, you know, like making sure that, you know, maybe you have a goal or a OKR or a BPM where like privacy is theirs. And so those people know that this is a goal for the company or it's part of their quarterly goals or achievements as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, <clears throat> when I, when I look at posts on LinkedIn, especially I, uh, what have you, what I've noticed usually is that security, when it comes to security, people assume it to be more a technical problem. And when it comes to privacy, people assume it to be more a, a, a legislative, a, 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 yeah, a legislative problem, I could say, right? So what do you have to say to uh, people like when they assume security as a technical challenge and privacy as a legislative issue? Do you think that privacy could be viewed as a technical debt to society? And how could companies rectify it? I think it's, yeah, I mean, if you look 20 years ago, at least in the U.S., you know, I'm going to go back in history and kind of explain why I'm taking this this position, this kind of thought pattern, is, you know, um, everyone was being hacked, right? Like you were, your data was, was exposed in credit card hacks. People were getting your social security number and opening up bank accounts or credit cards in your name. I mean, that could, that still happens in the U.S., but there's more control, so it doesn't happen. Um security was a legislative issue then too, right? Like multiple data breach laws were passed in different states. And, you know, if there was a data breach, it, uh, you would be notified. And a lot of companies, you know, there could be a giant lawsuit. Um, you know, they had like companies had to pay huge fees and usually provide like free data breach monitoring or something. So it was initially a legislative issue 20 years ago. And then that's when kind of security departments started building up. And the whole practice of a security function, which is more mature than a privacy function, built into, you know, let's make sure we have these technical controls if something happens um, and different security monitoring tools, et cetera. And so that's why it's very technical. But there's actually also a very legislative side and like legal side of security as well. Like, for example, I know someone, um, data, uh, data Breach RX, like a, um, a professional colleague I know, colleague I know who was a, a former litigator, then created a data breach kind of tool, uh, where like if you do have a data breach, you know there are certain there's a lot of legal guidelines you have to follow. Like you have to notify authorities within a certain period of time. It depends on the type of data that was accessed. So I I wouldn't say security is entirely a, you know engineering function i think that the tools and the controls to prevent engineering from to prevent the data from being leaked is much more of an engineering solution and but then if there is that incident there are like legal issues that need to be dealt with and needs to be handled properly um now fast forward to privacy i mean we are just not as you know mature as in in um as, as a security department is or just in the kind of the privacy world, like privacy has been a fundamental human right um, and an issue, but people weren't necessarily thinking about data and how data is accessed and used on the internet. Um, so I, I think it will, you know, I think it's both. It's going to, you know, the state, it's going to continue to be, you know, legislatures are going to think about the rules and what they are and 
But we also have, as the rules are coming out, you know, you're seeing more tools and technologies to help secure the data in a privacy manner. Um, so it, it's both, you know, it's, it's going to be both. I particularly like when you said data leakage because uh, when I when I because to me I don't uh, like to me privacy don't mean anything because to someone else it could mean something else right so I would uh, the way I define privacy and security is uh, through one through two words actually information flow right so if your information flow yeah. is get like if it is let's say it is going from point A to point B and if it is going unsniffed that is secure. OK, and then it has reached point B and how, the point, you know, the, the people at point B is going to use it, uh, you know, in for what intentions uh, and uh, is it only meeting those intentions or is it also being used for some extra purposes? Could could be anything, could be profitable, could be good, could be ethical, could be nefarious. So the information flow and where it is going, I guess that's a more accurate if, you know, if you were to ask me. And uh, this actually brings me to the next question, which is a bit of a sensitive subject about uh, the privacy, like how privacy ties into the, the recent uh, ruling of the American Supreme Court of overturning of the Roe versus Wade uh, you know, uh, ruling. So in the US, there has been much talk about uh, overturning Roe v. Wade. So as an outsider, Outsider means like I'm not an American citizen, right? So what are the privacy implications there? Could you help me to understand? Like how would the overturning of Roe v. Wade make data privacy laws egregious matters of life and death? Yeah, so that's, a, um, you know, in the, you know, that's interesting because I've like my life as a woman, I've always lived in, in New York and California. So I've been in kind of states that have, um, you know, rights for women in that area. Um, touching on kind of what the privacy implications here are is that, you know, the belief is that, you know, private, like right to your body, like right to what you can do with your body from a medical perspective is really kind of a fundamental human right. And like being able to, um, I'll use kind of something like another example, just as an analogy, like, let's say, you know, you, you're like, you know, you're working on your will and you're thinking about, oh, if something happens to me and I get in a really bad car crash and I'm in a coma and, you know, they can't do anything and I'm just lying there in life support. You know, when you work on your will in the U.S., they say, do you want to or you go into surgery? Do you want to be a DNR? Do not resuscitate um, because kind of the quality of life for that person could not be there, you know, and that's why now it's written to things like wills or, you know, if you're going in for a major surgery in the U.S. So like that person who's going in can make that decision and their family member doesn't have to make that decision if something terrible happens. So that's use that as an analogy and like, yeah, like your body, what you do with your body, um, whether you have a medical procedure or not, is like a fundamental kind of right to privacy. Um, so, you know, it, it, I think with that, like, I mean, the overturning of Roe versus Wade, you know, there's different political opinions in the US, you know, some people believe that like once a baby has been, you know, someone could be impregnated with a child that like that baby is life. Um, but then there are like serious medical issues around, you know, you know, especially as people in the US have children older, like in their late 30s and 40s, you know, there's more chances for miscarriages and genetic diseases. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you could be pregnant and the baby could not be viable. And then you, you know, there's situations like there's trisomy, like there's certain genetic disorders where the baby could not be viable. And it's really better to protect the mother to, you know, have that abortion versus the baby continuing to live. Um, so, I mean, hopefully, you know, the, the science, the world of medicine and science and protecting individuals and the right to privacy and people to make that decision will be, you know, figured out. And it's, um, it is, I do think, you know, it, it is part of life and death in a way that people, you know, should be able to decide what to do with their bodies in those in certain situations. That's really great. Thanks for, you know, I'm sure it was not very difficult for you to, like, it was very, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I believe, uh, I'm sure like it's, uh, it was not very easy for you to say this because, um, like as a as as a foreigner, I can only imagine how difficult it must be for you to speak on such a sensitive matter. 
So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And I mean, I'm, I feel lucky to live in a state in California where, you know, I know that women's rights are protected. So uh, now on a lighter topic, <laughs> uh, privacy as a product, right? So now this is a distinction, right? So uh, I would love to know your thoughts over here, especially as a CPO. See, um, clearly there has to be a natural union between privacy rules, regulations and laws and the privacy enhancing technologies, both the legislative side and both the engineering side. How do you think the companies who obviously have fiduciary duties to be and remain profitable to their investors capitalize on privacy as a product? Like my question is, the more European or, or a more socialist or, or, or more natural perspective of privacy is that it should be, a, it is a human right, right? And it is, nobody's arguing that. But in the, in the digital era, if you were to have privacy, someone will have to pay for it, right? So, uh, like, it is not easy to set up an engineering team, to set up a legal department who would be overview, you know, overviewing if your data is getting leaked or not, right? So, someone will have to pay for it. So, perhaps the companies will have a more capitalistic view to view privacy as a product. Like, is it even evil? Like, is it even evil to think along those lines where most people can, what, like? where most people are considering privacy as a right, whereas company may view privacy as a product. Yeah, no, I mean, I believe there's just, there's so many angles of privacy in general when you think about it. You know, there's, um, like this goes back to the IAPP teaches kind of a basic fundamentals of privacy and they talk about, you know, there's, I'll use communications privacy, right? Like you have the right to say, I don't want a company to market to me or email me, right? When you get text messages from an organization, it says, you know, if you would like to not receive this, say stop. And you say stop. That's like kind of a fundamental, like I don't want to be nagged through telemarketing or solicitation or an email communication for mar marketing. I have the ability to opt out. That's like a kind of a communications privacy. There's, you know, you think of privacy as a fundamental right, um, you know, be like protecting your body or, you know, your place in, of your home and being able to kind of be private at your home. Um, and then you move to, you know, a company. I do believe, you know, organizations have fid fiduciary data to remain profitable. And um, but I don't believe that, you know, privacy as a product is a bad thing. Um, it could be more my opinion. You know, I think that it's actually great in a way that more organizations are putting more money towards privacy and thinking about it strategically um, as, as a product versus a compliance obligation. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I say that is because it helps them, you know, there might be, they're thinking more strategically about it. Like, yes, we want to do the right thing. We want to meet the compliance obligations, but, um, how can we show that this is also like beneficial to our company as a value or a feature? Yeah. Um, that's, that's my opinion. I mean, it's kind of like ESG is similar, like, you know, like having a, um, like a environmentally friendly approach. Mm -hmm. um, it's that's, you know, they're just thinking of it as a product is thinking about how are we really making sure we're kind of, looking at this strategically, what's our roadmap around this? What's our metrics? Like, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. Well, thank you for saying that, you know, uh, because uh, because uh, this is a very sensitive issue. Like it is, honestly speaking, a very contrarian view, right? Most people don't want to see it as a uh, it has a, a product, like right? so, because as soon as you attach the word product to it, people believe, yeah, do you want me to pay for my own privacy? How dare you say that? Yeah, they'll suddenly get, get angry, right? But I guess the true, you know, correct way of answering this would be when you view privacy as a product, you don't, consumers don't have to pay for it. It's just that companies should be paying for it. Like companies should work hard to, to ensure that the, their, uh, you know, that the um, user's uh, data is actually kept private and secure. And more companies do it, the lower the price will it be. Perhaps it will be even free. You know, like uh, because building products is not cheap, right? And uh, to 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 have at least to remain profitable, you need to have cash flow. So uh, I guess that's a healthy way to look at it. And uh, especially as an engineer, um, uh, 
I guess it's a it, it, it gives me some comfort and solace that if my product were to be safe and secure and it is ultimately free and if it is giving someone an idea about as a right to them my product is someone else's right I guess that is excellent to me so to speak right so um, so so far we've been um, talking about um, uh, you know uh, the present and the past um, this industry at least to me I could be wrong though okay uh, so you could correct me if I'm wrong I believe is very nascent uh, the proof tech so proof tech or proof law whatever you want to call it privacy in general so and I truly believe that we can't see too much into the future but a short distance ahead only but a lot has to be done My question two is how do you see the future of proof tech privacy tech in general unfolding in the coming years Yeah, sure. I mean, this has been a really fascinating space to kind of watch. Like once the GDPR came out, um, you know, there were a lot of products and tools that helped with the compliance obligations. So, right, like um, DPIAs, assessments, assessing the risk and kind of going through checklists, um, controls frameworks or controls tools, you're seeing those being more mature. Um, and then one of the reasons I actually went to Skyflow is because one of our products, our, our main product is a privacy PII vault as a service, as an API. And at, after being at larger tech companies and working on GDPR implementation, I would sit down with engineers and there was so much PII everywhere um, in different databases, you know, just, you know, not, um, there was a lot of massive cleanups that a lot of organizations had to do. So I, you know, you're seeing a lot of, engineers and product managers coming together and thinking about how can we solve this project like how product this problem how can we think about privacy up front um, from the architecture architecture standpoint and so i definitely see this this future unfolding you know you're seeing a lot of people in the privacy space really looking for more technologies around encryption of data like um access to data, you know, where it's masked and you can't see the actual sensitive data, like tokenization, holding only the data you need in a vault versus having it spread everywhere. You know, those, these, I do believe these are fundamental concepts that were written into the GDPR, like data minimization, data privacy by design and default. Um, so as, as I said before, you know, as you see the legislation and the rules and the interest in the industry growing, you see more people like, product managers, engineers, thinking about how can we solve this? So I do feel that this space is going to grow and evolve over the next you know, 20 years and continue from there. Um, I have an additional question to it. Like um, when, I, for example, let's say I start my own gig. All right, so uh, privacy, if my primary uh, you know, pro product that I'm offering is, what I've no, okay, so let me rephrase it in a better way. So. Uh, let's say I'm offering a product. Now, in of itself, if it is only privacy, people don't usually care, right? So most people, what I've noticed is that for uh, for them, privacy is just, uh, you know, at least for an average, it is an afterthought and it's a, it's a nice to have feature, right? So however, if someone else is offering a better product without privacy, I can I can, I can see that, uh, at least I, I've seen that people will, will, will migrate to, to them rather than me who might be a bit lower uh you know lower engineering speaking maybe uh the ui ux is very clunky and it's not very user friendly but but at least i provide provide privacy right so i really want that to change right not because i want to be profitable but but forget me but uh i want to be uh to live in a more secure and a secure world where where the data uh it, it, you know well, the basic protocols of our data uh, is 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 understood and is actually um, you know uh, is a word I'm looking for is um, well let, let's just say that it, it's kept in order, right? So how do you say how, how do you like what thoughts do you have for this particular thing? What I, what I told you right here, like regarding the the, the migrate regarding people choosing like regarding people choosing a better product without a privacy versus people, uh, you know, choosing mm -hmm. us, a, a, perhaps an inferior product with privacy. Yeah. So I'll just like, I'll say hypothetically, like using Gmail, which is a free product, but they might, they 
collect your data and ads for targeting versus using like um, kind of a, another like paying for a, a product that's not selling data based on advertising mm. that might not have as nice features. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's an interesting dilemma. I mean, I think part of that is just you think about the ecosystem that the these tools were built on, you know, like Google and advertising and Facebook and search and um, online advertising is that's just how they were made. Like you get to use, you know, Facebook and connect with your friends and, you know, they, they target ads to you or Instagram. That's just kind of how it was built and and how these companies made money. Um and then, but then you have Apple, you know, Apple does have minimal ad targeting, even though they are getting a little more in the space, but they also have very kind of good products as well. Um, I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, you know, I think that, I think that people will, you know, continue to be attracted by nice features and tool, like a functional tool that they can use. And they have to think of the value you know, the value um, pull, like, you know, like what their values are. Um, so I got, I'll use kind of an also a kind of a specific example. I remember at one point I decided to turn off like all the ad targeting on my browser um, so the ads couldn't be targeted to me. And then I received really bad ads when I was reading articles like the dancing baby or the, you know, um, and I said, oh, okay, actually, I'd prefer to have some more targeted ads because it's more interesting when I'm reading an article. Um, and so I just turned them back on. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, you have to understand the value. Like, I mean, I'm not searching for anything nefarious. Like I'm not searching for guns or things that, you know, I'm trying to hide. It's like shoes or something like that. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. It is a dilemma that the way you say because I had a word with an AI engineer. He he said, and most people in this space are still convinced that people don't really, really care about privacy as long. I mean, if someone else is providing you a very good service and they are not really private or secure, well, they will. You know, they will actually. Most people will actually migrate to them, and that is very upsetting. But I guess uh, this is where the sin of uh, omission would come into picture, right? You know, uh, don't don't follow them. Well, you they find. Simple, simply by GDPR or whatever they yeah. that. Yeah. I guess it's. I mean, one thing I do want to call out though is is kind of going back to the Roe versus Wade thing is that that is you know really, that's scary. Like you don't know if, you know, if you live in a state where let's say you go to have an abortion and you know, for whatever reason and then someone's tracking you and then you could get in trouble. Like that feels very like kind of surveillancey. Yeah. Um, and, and, and like I said, like I live in a state where I don't have to worry about that. Um, but, you know, it, it does get creepy when you kind of think about like, you know, you don't know what these companies do, unfortunately. Like you don't know when you use an app who like and you enable your location data where that data being is data is it being sold in the data broker industry um, and who it's being shared with. So it, it's definitely like a very much of a wild west out there. So. I say that, you know, you have, you do have to be, it is good for people to be educated and aware of like what, who you're giving your data to and why, and what are their practices and what's their history. Um, and, and I think that's where kind of regulation comes into and enforcement because you are starting to see more enforcement around that area as well, investigations. Right. So um, on, on lighter topic. Let's have a few rapid fire questions. So this you can answer any way you see fit, just for you know, so fun. So I'll ask you a few questions, and you'll have to choose uh, either both or none of them, right? So privacy as a product versus privacy as a right. Uh, privacy as a right. Metaverse is it boon or bane? I don't know. I'm just not that cool. <laughs> I have two kids under six. I don't even know. <laughs> right, right. I think the VR stuff would be really cool, though, because I saw like an ad when I was watching a baseball game with my son of like a VR kind of thing, how to teach you how to baseball. And I was like, that's cool. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, where does your heart lie? Does it lie in privacy management? or privacy engineering? 
I have to say, you know, being a privacy leader, being the space for so long and not being an engineer by my background, I would say privacy management, but I do, you know, I am delving more into the world of privacy engineering and I feel like that anyone can really learn it. Um, All right. So. Okay. So basically yeah. both. Yeah. <laughs> right. Kind of both. Yeah. All right. So one thing that new up and coming startups must keep in mind to preserve the privacy of user data. Um, I would really think, you know, tone from the top, like you need to have the buy-in from the, the CEO or the head, you know, the organization, um, thinking about privacy from the very beginning. Right. Oh yeah. Okay. That's really good. Privacy by design. You... And architecting for privacy. Yeah. From the very beginning, you know, cause it's going to be harder and more expensive to fix it in the future. That's really good. Basically, you know, privacy by design, I believe. So, um, what would be a one-way ticket to be fined under any 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 uh, data privacy law like GDPR, CCP for any company, according to you? Um, in my experience, you know what I've seen is that basically any sort of data breach, um, where it has to be reported to the regulator, generally ensures a fine for sure. Okay. Or or a consent decree or a combination of the two. Okay. And uh, your hope for the coming generations of privacy pros, perhaps like me, uh, you know, a, your word of encouragement for us. Um, you know, uh, be intellectually curious. I have found that people that in the industry are, you know, generally willing to help and generally willing to educate and, you know, do things like this, like podcasts, um, you know, I think just, you know, want to learn and want to understand kind of the different implications of privacy, kind of like you, you know, you're thinking of it, not just from like a academic purely standpoint is trying to understand how it actually works in the real world. And that after being in the real world, doing this for years, like that's really, you know, might not be as idealistic as you see in, in the books, just like anything. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, uh, Robin, perhaps the toughest question of all. If you were to finish your autobiography, perhaps with one line, what would, what would it be? That's a hard one. Um, it would be that hopefully I protected the privacy of millions of people through my career. So, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that was Robin with us. She's been an amazing audience, amazing guest, amazing person to chat with. Thank you so much, Robin, for coming here. Thank you. Yeah, it was great to meet you and great to work on this podcast with you. I'd be happy to do it again. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>